And we're live. Welcome to Fake Whale, everybody. Welcome to Fake Whale, Matthew. We have Matthew from Nifty Gateway here today. How are you doing, Matthew? Pretty good, man. How are you doing, Jesse? Pretty chill. Nice Monday morning here. Not sure when this is going to air. Probably not a Monday, but it's Monday right now. So, Matthew, uh, we really appreciate your time. We know how fucking busy you are. Like, you know, Nifty is just never not popping off. Right. You know, so yeah. there's um, surely no shortage of things for you to be doing besides talking to us. So we really appreciate your, your time here. And I want to kick this conversation off um, because I'm not um, super familiar with you, uh, to be honest, you know, um, and I'm going to use this conversation as a way to and I apologize for looking at my phone right now, but I'm pulling up uh, the, the reference that I want to use to jump into this conversation because you use some interest, an interesting word here. Um, but just the other day you, you tweeted bullish on everyone who is playing the infinite game of living a rare life, doing rare things and collecting rare experiences. I really enjoyed this tweet, but particularly your use of the word infinite game. Um, is that something that you kind of just used on the spot or are you familiar with that book? Um, finite and infinite games or the concept of finite and infinite games. Um, so I didn't read the book The I came across the term infinite game, maybe a couple years ago now. Um, at a, a whip meetup. So in addition to being creative- A what meetup? Uh, so there's a, a metaverse meetup event that I've been running uh, with my my other metaverse dude, uh, Rizzle, for about almost three years now. Um, so every Thursday, 12 p.m. Pacific, uh, a whole bunch of us meet up in virtual worlds. It had been usually like crypto voxels, um, but these days experimenting more moniverse and get a couple hundred folks that are listening in on on speakers giving updates and things like that um try to keep it weird try to keep it wild running around in this virtual okay space as we're getting these updates right um so around like april 2020 uh, i think simon daily rivier hopped on one of the early early whips and he was talking about infinite games and that was the first time i'd heard about that concept and it just struck me really deeply as like, oh, this is, this is the game I've been playing, <laughs> just pursuing what, what I love to do and having just that as a goal in and of itself, something that's not zero sum, something that's more complementary, um, something that you can kind of pull on past experiences and just keep leveling up, but there's no final boss that you need mm -hmm. to defeat in anything. It's just basically a way to kind of look at life and enjoy living life. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, since jumping yeah, into the infinite game, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. And I, I think jumping into the space like as a collector and then just gaining the friendship of so many other artists and seeing how, how the artists are creating. It's just like we're all sort of playing these infinite games, whether we identify like how we're living life as an infinite infinite game or otherwise, right? And just trying to draw more attention to that fact. Um, I think is pretty important. Yeah. Yeah, this idea of finite infinite games, I think is is interesting almost to any intellectual who comes across it. Um, because it's a different way of kind of framing your your worldview, I guess, you know, um, the idea of a finite game being one where there's a winner at the end and that winner is decided by everybody playing, you know, like and everybody agrees that this person won and that's the winner of the game. It, so many people view life that way like view their career view like what they're doing whatever it may be as this you know i must win you know where I, you know but you're never going to like that's not a thing that happens in life right and that's your because you can only play the game if you're willing you know a willing participant otherwise it's not playing you're not playing the game right so mm -hmm. i don't know i just i when i came across it i found it to be a pretty uh enlightening kind of perspective and also to the reason it really stood out to me in that tweet is because um a really good friend of mine's band named an album of their infinite games and when i did their album cover i really dove into this concept or whatever so then i saw it in your tweet and was like well that's perfect you know like this is great and it also i think said a lot about you you know so like i wanted to you, you touched on like your collecting and kind of early days but i really want to go back to those early days because um a mutual friend of ours obviously sky golpe uh, filled me in and said, you know, like, you know, this guy's been around for a long time, way before Nifty, you know, like he was doing his own thing. Um, and, and I would love to hear about some of those early days and maybe how you got into it. But even before that, I think 
I would like to hear like what your definition, I guess, of rare is in accordance to that tweet, you know, like rare experiences and rare this and that you say. And I think that's a really good lead in, though, to like your experience in like how you got into Web3, because you must have been looking for a rare experience if you found yourself there so early. Yeah. So, I mean, going way back, I feel like I started to, to finally live rare when I decided to leave America after you, after I graduated high school. So I'd always wanted to go to Asia. I always wanted to learn Korean specifically, just because I had a bunch of mates that I met back in middle school days. Um, and then when I graduated high school, I was like, okay, well, this is YOLO, right? <laughs> you, <you'll... laughs> uh, I had worked a couple summers landscaping. I had funds to go over, like join a, a language academy over there for a full year and just like do that. Wow. So that's what I did and graduated language academy after a year living in Seoul, loving it, just being like super overwhelmed, living in the little matchbox house, like super. Are you fluent style. at this point? Yeah. yeah. So you're I fluent at that point. And then, yeah. Can I ask how old you were? Uh, yeah, I was uh, 18 when I left. Okay. What was your life like before that? Just real quick too, if you don't mind, just like, you know, young days, like, create a family, non-create a family, fucking finance, were you wealthy, were you not, were you lived on the street, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Um, I guess until I was in like third grade, family moved around a bunch. I was originally born in like Alabama. My dad worked at GE, so he was a manager getting tossed around from Alabama to Indiana to outside of Jersey, and then ultimately to outside of Philadelphia where we were able to kind of like set up a base, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. Middle-class upbringing, since uh, elementary school, I'd say, graduating high school, like was never wanting for anything, um, but was able to be exposed to a whole bunch of folks living outside of Philadelphia, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I definitely really appreciate the fact that from like elementary school, there's everyone in school. It wasn't just like predominantly white or predominantly like another ethnicity in school. Everyone was there, everyone was learning. It was just like very cool to be able to meet mm -hmm. so many folks. Um, and I think that helped shape just me being open to wanting to do something different, but meeting my friends from Korea, I was just like, oh my God, like, you, you know, you how did you meet them in, in middle school? So they were, they were coming over. This is like, like a foreign exchange program. Uh, no, no, no. They were coming over like full, as full-time students. So this is oh, roughly okay. like 99, 2000, 2001. And that's roughly the time where in Korea, like they started opening up as a nation to more free travel of its citizens. Up until then, it was really hard for Koreans to get out of the country to study. Like if you're super wealthy, there's never any problems. But for like the majority of like the middle class over there, they really eased up on that foreign travel and like living abroad and stuff like that. So that's when a bunch of, yeah, just not now my mates, but at the time, just new Koreans cool. come into our school and we kick, it was awesome just meeting them. And the, the thing that really impacted me was walking by a group of Korean students and just not understanding anything that they were saying. They were, I mean, it's like a foreign, foreign language, you know, like mm -hmm. walk by folks that are speaking Spanish or French or German even, and like sort of grok at least some words, if you're not even familiar with the language, just because the familiarity is in pronunciation more or less. And I was just like in fashion. Well, and root languages a lot, you know, like root languages matter a lot where you can just pick up shit. But like when the root language is a completely foreign, you know, maybe visual even in nature, it's like, yeah. a, you know, very hard for our Western brains to like pick up on a lot of those. Yeah. And I, mean, I, that... I can't believe that you learned Korean, bro. Like, <laughs> I'm envious. <laughs> like that's that's very fucking cool. Yeah. And it, I mean, having that interest and like being curious, that was one thing, but like acting on it and making that decision to be like, okay, peace out America. I'm going to go try to do this thing. That was, that was that first step in, in that direction and going over there and being one of the few students at the time. Now it's obviously because of K-pop and everything, it's made way more popular for folks all around the world to come to Korea, to learn Korean because of mm -hmm. their interest in the culture and whatnot. But like being the only only Western dude <laughs> in classes, like me, having friends from all the Southeast Asian countries, ton of Chinese folks over there, just every day was almost like a UN lunch with folks. <laughs> Everyone from all around the world, mm -hmm. everyone meet them, but like 
being on your own, like totally, um, was very, was very interesting. And then, you know, like the eye opening moments of like, okay, learning the language and then seeing what other opportunities exist, like the university system over in, in Korea is amazing. Some top universities and not at like go bankrupt, go into a lifetime of debt, uh, tuition prices. And at the time they were trying to globalize their student population more. So they were giving crazy like, scholarships to people that wanted to study full-time at university. So I ended up going to Korean university and studying Chinese language and literature and like international studies, just super weird shit, right? Like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, that just like set me up for weird opportunities after after graduating and went up while I was studying. Like the the big chain wow. over there, like the conglomerates like Hyundai, Samsung, um, LG, they all try to hire from the top top universities over there. So they give wow. like internship opportunities and all that good stuff. So just applied for that, got into Samsung and ended up working at Samsung for over 10 years. <laughs> and then <laughs> that's what led me to crypto. Because yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was starting to, to see like how this is coming together, you know. Yeah, and um, at, at Samsung worked in strategy and the construction arm of the business, which is super random, but there were a lot of expats that were based in Seoul back around like the early 2010s. And during those times, it was just, okay, let, finally meeting a bunch of expats after being in Korea for a minute. And we had like just regular morning coffee sessions together. And around like 2013, 2014, that's when a lot of the topics that we were talking about shifted to, to Bitcoin in particular. Oh. And Bitcoin never really interested me. Like the idea of just like the speculative asset. I was like, okay, like I invest in it like a stock and then a number goes up. Okay, not super interesting to me personally. But then... 2015, 2016, Ethereum, like smart contracts, programmable digital money. I was like, okay, this is very interesting to me. Like the, the <laughs> you know, you start to run wild. Like you listen to a podcast by like B'nai Buddha and you're like, holy fuck, like the world is fundamentally changed forever and always after this point, right? And that's where I got in with Ethereum and, and scooping up Ether. But the goal was always like, I want to use this for something, you know, like I want to interact with smart contract, that whole thing. And it really wasn't until 2017 when um, sent, like at the time, the crypto powered blog went live on mainnet in August. I came across it end of October 2017 as a user initially. And I was like, finally, a place where I can use Ether to, to do something at the time you could use ether instead of bouncy like on a post that you make to incentivize people to read it and like ask questions and engage with it and uh it just blew my mind and i became obsessed with the project wrote like 100 different blog posts about it pinging the original co-founders max and cameron was like yo you gotta let me in let me in i'll do whatever to be a part of this project and the team and joined the project early 2018 first employee and eventually became a co-founder of that. And that's where all the digital artists ended up going, talking about minting NFTs, minting their digital work as NFTs. So you got like the Coldies, the X copies, the Hackatows, Sky Gold Bay joined there, Matias C. Like all- Where is this again? What is this again? What, what, data what cent dot data co. Data dot cent dot what? Co? Beta, B-E-T-A. It's like in perma oh. data. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. Um, okay. So that's that's that that next level where, as a, so like, a member, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so like you're, are are you like one of the godfathers of NFTs? Are you one of the godfathers of crypto art? Are you uh, like one of the like? No, no, no. I, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I just think that but you um, made this place where, where like the very, like you were part of the very first place that these NFT artists or what are now considered NFT artists. I don't know what they were considered even then, but one of the first places that they congregated. That to me is, is giant. Like, I mean, that's yeah. like huge. That's, am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, we're all working together, right? So 
like the artists, they were doing their thing. And we just so happened to have a, a place where they could kind of post up and have a digital home of sorts. Like this is like crypto voxels was, was still very, very, very early. The Decentraland was still just like in development for like the, another year and a half before it went live. I mean, that, like after the launch of Scent. So like as a crypto native blogging forum for artists to come and talk about what they were doing and like NFT Twitter, crypto art Twitter wasn't a thing at all at that point still even. So having that home for them to post up and having a community of folks that were already okay, yeah. with crypto and people's writing and blog posts, it was just like that perfect, perfect landing for everyone. Yeah. It, like, yeah. Uh, for So you're kind of one of the godfathers of the crypto art community, I would say then, right? Like, because before that, there wasn't really community. I mean, there was, it just didn't have a hub and that community needs a community center. And you created that community center kind of. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's probably a better better framing of it. So that's where, like, a lot of the the collectors were able to come and finally talk about what they were doing. Yeah, see, like exactly, like this is important. Like that's why I said that. Like you know, I'm not not a god follower of crypto art, but like this idea of community that's so strong now. Like you were there at the very beginning and inception of that community, which is you know giant now. Like wow, that's crazy. Like I mean, that's just I'm a little shocked actually. Like I'm not. Um, so yeah, go ahead, like, like go on. You have this space that you created, like uh, artists are coming in, you have Xcopy, you have the Coldies, they're starting to talk and communicate. Uh, this is 2017, is it, did you say, 2018? So 2018, the end of 2018 into 2019 is when it really, really started to pop off. So like fall 2018 into early spring 2019, that's when the whole character of the site shifted from folks talking about crypto into nfts and then crypto art was really like that big turning point in 2019 it was like a whole gang of not, not gang of us like a, a grip of us were getting into collecting and interacting with the artists and mm. like going into crypto voxels the digital kind of virtual exhibitions that people were starting to plan like blackbox.art aka sparrow um max osiris was was huge um, WG Meets, uh, of course, Connie Digital. Connie Digital was super influential for a lot of the artists that were on scent back in the day with what he was doing in crypto voxels in terms of making his virtual galleries, exhibiting his work and art and bringing in collectors into the virtual space to interact with it together mm -hmm. was really sort of formative in what happened after with a lot of artists going into crypto voxels and having their own galleries. So the crypto voxels, especially in the early point in time, was like an artist centric spot for galleries. Like it was New York City, circa late 70s, early 80s, like the era of Warhol, Basquiat, Herring, all those folks that were posted up in like the grungy NYC of old, dirty, dangerous, but fucking exciting and rich with amazing artists and amazing art, right? And that was that was the time of Sen. <laughs> and everyone there was just like, okay, well, buying more art. Um, and like all time highs were a couple hundred bucks. And that 2019 mm -hmm. point, like a, another key moment was was with a, a lot of money in JaVinci when they released Saint Nakamoto around November 2019. I went into that auction hard and it was like at the end, me and Robness. And the ultimate sale price is like some eye watering like price of 1700 bucks, which is an all time high. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems ridiculous now even talking about it. Eye watering. <laughs> no, but people were like, you're fucking crazy. Like it makes no mm -hmm. sense. Like it, this is were, insane. <laughs> yeah, it was really polarizing at the time. Like people were stoked off of it that had been in the community for a while. And other people are like, that's so stupid. Why would you do it? But then writing about it and like me, like why I felt it was important, significant, like it was crucial. And then that's what inspired more artists to come in. And the next month, uh, Whale Shark jumped on to send and into the space. And like that purchase with St. Nakamoto was his tipping point to go in into crypto art and in like that major way that he did. And that elevated the other collect like whale collector behaviors like moderates. And I mean, you didn't see any like the next all time high was five figures. And then it was just off to the races because 2020 Pablo Colborn came into the whole space and 
ratcheted up another level, more artists coming in, more collectors, and that fed right into what happened last year in 2021 with that just ridiculous explosion at the beginning of the year there. Um, and that's that 2021 point is when I had just joined Nifty in January, right after pushing out the valuables release um, with the scent team. That's what let people take their tweets and mint them into NFTs. <laughs> and it's what um, Jack Dorsey used to sell his Genesis tweet for mm. a million bucks or whatever. Um, that was the last project wow. I worked on as a part of Scent before jumping over to Nifty Gateway. Oh, wow. 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 So at the, at the beginning, how many you said at first a gain and then you, you trimmed it down to a grip? How many are we talking, do you say, at that very beginning that were collectors? Um, in terms of like super active users, we probably had around between a 50 and a hundred like daily active. <laughs> and this is 2019. So yeah, 2019. Wow. We had, we had more users posting. We had more users coming on, but in terms of like that core group of us that we were like really tight with, um, that 50 to hundred mark, which included folks like Conlon and no shot, the founders of async art, like among them that were just playing around, collecting art themselves, building in crypto voxels. Um, yeah, it was a nice, fun, fun early time. No pressure, nothing. People just <laughs> and talking about it. Wow. I mean, the, the, the people should be taking notes. I've, I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm going to rewatch this and take notes because, I mean, this is a history lesson. It's absolutely insane to be talking to somebody who was there, like, from at the very beginning. I mean, I've talked with Robness, you know, um, in length before. Yeah. Um, but, it, I, you know, he's an artist. So, like, to hear from just a collector is really interesting like and and it, not even just a collector you know you're, you're very active um but the then transitioning into nifty um what was that about or like why did you do that it doesn't seem like it was necessary for you even you know like not not to put any no shade anywhere it's not what i mean it's just like it seemed like you had a good thing going or you could have taken a lot of routes maybe you had a lot of opportunity or you could have even just probably sat back at that point and mm -hmm. uh sold a bunch of nfts that you bought for a hundred dollars for tons of money and just sat you know but but instead you decided to go work for a company where it seems like you probably are just insanely busy in and just ratcheted up your responsibility and workload instead so can you talk about why you did that and what brought you to nifty gateway no for sure and like touching on the, the sales i've had several sales too, like all time highs for artists. Like one of the things that back in the day, like buying work, like one of ones for a couple hundred bucks and then like almost, almost $2,000. It was just like this belief that these are treasures, right? Like this is the history of our space. Like this is space art. That is future art. That is like, if you look back in a couple hundred years, like this is ridiculous. But proving out that you can collect art and then resell it was a huge focus for a while. And having those big secondary sales was just like, okay, it's real. It's happening. And, and focusing on that for me was really, really important as like an early collector in the space. You have a and, lot of and then before the Nifty thing too, I want to ask, was Nifty around for how long before you joined them too? Sorry to interrupt or whatever, but I was just wondering if there was like a parallel happening where they were starting out while you were still doing send, yeah. you know, and... So they, they came out, I think, late 2019, but they were a payment uh, provider. So they were like, their whole solution was something that they wanted to approach other marketplaces with their payments. Oh. Use credit okay. cards, buy NFTs. That was their initial approach. Oh. <laughs> okay. Right? And then 2020, they, they were acquired by Gemini. They pivoted to developing their own marketplace, which let people use their credit card to buy NFTs early. And that's when like they... They launched with Josie back in the day um, and a bunch of other early artists. And that was building momentum throughout 2020 and definitely on my radar. They were speakers at the, the WIP meetup, right? So was clocking what they were doing. And at the time at Scent, when like the biggest joy that I got was interacting with the artists, finding new artists, collecting their mm -hmm. work interviewing them on like an old podcast that I had um, that was called like the spotlight where I was talking with, with all the artists, especially after I collected them, I was just like, okay, I collect you. Like, I would love to talk with you. Um, just get into the process, like how you work as an like, I love that. Like, I love it. It's infinite inspiration <laughs> for me personally. 
So in 2020, this is sort of like a, an aside, but pretty important. And like the reason why I ended up shifting away from SEM. So startup lands, you have all, all these competing tensions. Um, do you focus on this or that? And you always have to make choices. And there, we just had made this decision to totally change our, our website, our UI, um, our branding, like all these, all these changes that we decided to do all at once, which in retrospect was the worst decision in the world because we totally changed the character of the site and made it inaccessible for a lot of users. Like there's just a bunch of updates. Any update always has bugs with it that you need to fix and refine. You make a bunch of changes all at once. There's just that many more bugs to deal with <laughs> to the point where it's just the, the use started to go down um, pretty dramatically and it started to be not fun. Like I couldn't use it anymore. I was a power user. It was hard for me to engage with it and, and share and write like I had been doing, right? So in, like individual, I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I need to set myself up for, for something next. And I knew that I wanted to do something with, with crypto art and obviously it was, okay, what are the platforms doing? So had interviews with async art, super rare, um, hmm. uh, nifty gateway, of course, open C known origin didn't speak to, uh, makers place didn't reach out to, um, but I got a good sense of what everyone else is doing. And it was all very interesting and async art, love those folks. Um, but they were just getting started too. totally different place. Wasn't like a natural fit for me. Open C was interesting, but it was more like stay in community. Um, there was definitely more of a bias for, okay, you don't have a CS degree from like Stanford or, or somewhere, probably in my personal opinion at the time, looking at it, not a lot of room to grow, which in hindsight is probably pretty accurate. Super is dope. <laughs> They, of course, like it was super rare. And then when I spoke with Nifty Gateway, it was like, damn, both of them going back and forth in my mind. But mm. what, the key difference was the team at Nifty Gateway was just, they're so focused on the product. They're all dog fooding it. Everyone was using it. The, the vision was really clear, make it super easy for people to be able to collect this in whatever way that makes sense. Everyone was aligned on that vision um, at super rare. Everyone was aligned on it, but there was still like these internal discussions on the side about like weird or interesting ways the company could go. And coming from Scent, I was like, okay, this is very similar, super startup-y, mm -hmm. like it's a vibe if you want to get into those challenges and all that. But for me, I wanted clarity. Like I wanted a place where like you hit the ground running, like you, you, you know what to mm -hmm. do. There's no like real second guessing. So for me, like that choice going from pure startup to a startup that had product market fit that that's where i wanted to go versus super rare which also had product market fit but there are more questions that the team was battling with internally and they were growing like super quick which for me is like oh you're going in there's so many more new faces you're competing with these new test tensions and questions that's sort of like behind the scenes look into like my decision process to to go to nifty gateway at that point um and it's been a pretty awesome decision since then, personally. It's it's um it's actually really interesting to hear how you made that decision because it's at least as far as I'm concerned, once you know your direction, you know, like once you have your decision made up, you know, it's best to just go forward and not, you know, kind of like have to sit around and second guess this kind of shit. So like I admire that decision, like uh and the way that you made it seems really smart and intelligent. You know, you knew you wanted to go forward, not do this for a while or just like, you know, go sideways for a while that you wanted to go up and that Nifty was going up uh, at that speed. So that sounds, you know, it's super smart decision making. It's very, very interesting to hear what all these platforms were like in these early days. You know, I like Super Rare a lot as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nifty, I came to later um, because it's different, you know, mechanics than Super Rare that it didn't. It's more. Um, I don't even know the word. It's more, it's almost more web three ish web three E than, than super rare, I guess. But, um, I want to pivot just a little bit because you yeah. touched on how much you appreciated talking to artists that you collected, bringing them on a podcast that you had even, and, and all that, but you didn't talk at all about like, before all of this, did you have an appreciation for the arts? Did you take art classes? Did you, you know, date artists? Did you go to galleries a lot? Did you, you know, like, what is your arts background beforehand? 
or was it for you really like this is the art of crypto and that's why i like it and that's my introdu introduction to art or was it like i've always liked art and noticed that art is always referential to the time and it's an important historical marker etc cetera, etc cetera. and within this context this is that yeah but i would say my background in art before crypto art was was purely from a perspective of appreciating artists as as creators and how unique and rare that gift is and just like the the aesthetic kind of pleasure that i got from from looking at great work and learning the like the background of a piece like the history of it um the the stories about the art were always very fascinating to me but my family they never collected art um maybe we went to museums but museums like as a kid they i never went to i guess good galleries or i'm not even really sure if they exist because i was always so put off by the experience it was just mm. um, it was it was like the museums were mainly it felt forced you're walking in zero context very boring presentation just like okay this is interesting these are names that i recognize but like it's, it's almost overwhelming too as well um i think maybe the most positive experience i had and this is before I left the States to go to Korea, it was when I went to the Barnes Foundation outside of Philadelphia with my mother. And that was like a private collector, super eccentric dude. Um, and he just went hard into like Renoirs and Monets and Picassos back in the day. And it just has an absurd private collection that he just, his whole house is art. <laughs> All the wow. walls are completely filled with this amazing art, like packed, right? And like learning more, about the the history of how like especially in certain like parisian houses and galleries how art used to be exhibited was like way more eccentric like walls of art just covering and peppering the place and that was just that was really impressive to me and that's probably the most impactful early experience i ever had with art and that's totally translated to like how i have like mm -hmm. my galleries my virtual art galleries set up right um but having that that open open mindset to appreciating the art itself and the artist. I think that just staying in that open mindset helped me. So when I came into crypto and seeing these artists here, I was like, oh my God, that's pretty cool. And then finally having the ability to buy art because before that, what is a kid going to do? <laughs> Am I going to get invited to a gallery to buy something? I don't think so. My family was never invited to those galleries. Like, I guess I could go to the seashore and get like a print in some shop, but like that's <laughs> you know, the like, that was, yeah, like that's <laughs> not something that was fundamentally fundamentally interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this is a beautiful story. I think that there is certainly a parallel here between you saying that you would go to a museum, kind of felt off put, and then how you had this opportunity, which I don't even understand how it arose, but you had this opportunity to go to this eccentric collector's house outside of Philadelphia. Um, I'm 100% seeing the parallel between the traditional art world as that museum and this eccentric collector's house that you went to as the crypto art space. You know, it makes complete sense why you would uh, gravitate towards a crypto art space if that's you know what you were gravitated towards back then uh direct contact with the artists who are also eccentric the collectors probably were very eccentric but i just think there's a very beautiful connection between that that little story and in the position you're in now and the appreciation you found for the art um at the very beginning because those artists at the beginning you know you you mentioned coldy you mentioned x copy uh, ravenous max they're all very different they're all like you know just um <laughs> chaos <laughs> honestly which yeah. is dope i mean i'm a fan of all of them um, much respect much love but maybe you can talk a little bit about that early uh crypto art aesthetic and like what you thought about it and just like what what did you think about the way that artists were exploring this new territory because mm, how do you even word it because there's been digital art for a long time but crypto art was different like, it, you know what I mean? Like there was uh, self-referential was part of it, obviously, as is any sort of like subculture, cultural mm -hmm. kind of uh, inception. Um, but but like even the experimentation, because it had nothing to do even with like, I'm so good at something or another. It was just like, I'm crazy. Look at this fucking meme, fucking nut shit, you know? And like, so yeah, could you say something maybe about about that? 
yeah um like the the art what and the artists what really impacted me the most um in like early days of crypto art was how serious the artists were right it wasn't like they're having fun with the creation process obviously but they they were super serious about their craft like like an inconceptually serious too yes it's something that like when yeah. i look at early crypto art is what i really really like about it is like yeah maybe they are using like you know this mashup tool or like whatever robinance does with like the most like kind of simple you know almost ridiculous creation methods but robinance is high concept art like it always has been x copy if you look at it enough high concept art all these early crypto artists are pretty high concept artists really you know regardless of what the end product looks like so anyways go on no 100 percent. and they're like deadly serious about it even if they're having fun with it which is like the best combination to be deadly serious mm -hmm. and be super fucking flippant and fun and be like fuck you kind of like robin is really embodies <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of crypto art perfectly um he's my like when it comes to crypto art you know like he's the guy that i would just say like yeah if it if we're talking about crypto art, it's Robness to me. That's it. Yeah. I think they don't need to. And it, it was him and Max for the, the longest time. Like, there, yeah. there are multiple breakups since. Is like, yeah. <laughs> in my mind, though, it's just like, that's all part of the performance. Like, yeah. I'm just know. going to say real quick anybody that's interested, go back and listen to the Robness episode because that went on for like three hours where he talks about some of that shit. <laughs> yeah. It's, so just, it's just amazing. But like that that seriousness, you have to appreciate it. And when, when you, when you talk to the artists about their process and like how they conceptualize their work and like the, the meaning that they see in their work, that's where like you you are, it's a, what the fuck moment? Like, Oh my God, this is so amazing, right. To be in this new space, to have the, the influence of what crypto or decentralization means or could mean interpreted by a lot of these artists and mm -hmm. the mere act of minting and making this work available and having this like universal potential base of collectors have and then the collectors coming in and, and scooping this and creating their own kind of like worlds around it and their myth mythos and stories and all that because it was just like oh my god this is it this this is what we've been waiting for i think a lot of people early in crypto excited by the potential, but weren't able to translate that potential in a way that most people can understand. But with art, it's right there in your face. At the base, it just, does it impact you? Do you love it? Does it speak to you? And if it does that, like that's the door into like this next level of, well, what's behind it? What are the, the tech standards? What is the tech standards even allow for? Like, this is future art. How is it different from art that's existed before? How is it the same? Like all these extra questions that are like anyone can ask and anyone can attempt to answer regardless of what their background is. It's just, yeah. <laughs> was there any, what was, was there like, was the pair, like the parallel had to start being drawn between that, like it, it, it art has been used as a store of value for a long time for historic historically used as a store of value as an asset um beyond what people are even aware of probably most people like mm -hmm. um you know documentaries about this though you know i talked about it before uh, the price of everything on hbo is a really good documentary that talks mm -hmm. about this but like there's so many wealthy collectors of art in the world that own probably some of the biggest most expensive pieces that have zero appreciation for it that that it literally sits in cold storage somewhere mm -hmm. and it and it's there and it and it these these pieces somewhat get traded amongst these wealthy classes because it's um important that they maintain their value um because it literally is just a storage of it. it's an investment at this point so there had to have been those parallels dr uh, drawn between crypto art and then the traditional market because well not because but also there's like the point be the point of why art as the case use for this for 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 ethereum for smart contracts for for this new technology why not you know just any other number of whatever fuck it could be any literally anything right because in the, we're gonna nfts can be anything right so like why why was art such this like 
like such such a use case at the beginning or like um and they, I did talk with Colborn recently too and I don't know when these are all going to be airing or whatever but I've been friends with Colborn for like a year or whatever mm -hmm. but um we got into that conversation a little bit, you know, because he was talking about, or we brought up music and about how music he doesn't believe is the best use case for NFTs, maybe, you know, but yeah. how art, you know, in my opinion, art was just ripe for the picking. It, it, it's not been exploited yet, at least digital art, at least even more particularly like social media art, uh, you know what I mean? You know, so like, this is like a, an asset or like a, not even an asset, a, a, a class of, of something that hasn't been exploited and, whatever but then also too there must be other ways and maybe more of a technical sense that using art to showcase this technology makes sense could you talk about that yeah i mean well art is this historic like human primitive like as long as humans have been humans they've been creating and leaving art behind and artifacts but right? but like why visual art in particular because music's art too and everything you know so like and music is just as old as, as visual art maybe even older um yeah. Whatever, but like visual art in particular. Yeah, I mean, well, you have the the history behind visual art, right? And then you have like the tendency and need for man mankind for humans to collect, right? Like our natural impulse, regardless of our socioeconomic position in society, is to collect things. Like every house is a vessel of collections within it, right? For, <laughs> you know what I mean? They can- they can The house is a collection. You just, you, you, you're a collection of one, you collected a house. <laughs> no, exactly. And then even if you don't have a physical house, like every, whatever you have on your person, like these are the artifacts that you have. Mm -hmm. And then going more meta, it's like, well, your experiences in life and like what you choose to remember, like what you write down, like these are all modes of collecting, right? So that impulse to collect, that instinct to collect coupled with the visual art, which has this tradition, like this mo more modern tradition too, of collecting with an added, like a monetary value commonly associated with it. I think mm -hmm. just, and, and like the universal accessibility of like, mm -hmm. that the internet provides and crypto uh, enables, it just like, it all came together in this yeah. really interesting point in time where it was familiar exactly. Right. It had historic precedent and it's super easy <laughs> to collect. Like mm -hmm. you collect one work of crypto art, one NFT, period. It's it's slippery as slope. It's only a matter of time until you get your second one. And then it's just <laughs> and then it's it's hard to I love physical art too, as a result of collecting digital art. Like my virtual digital world is so beautiful. I want my physical world to kind of reflect that beauty being surrounded by beauty is amazing but collecting digital art is like you take your whole whole collection around with you and going back to like um like how people used to collect they just hit it right so you could have a, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you could have a collector with the best intentions with the art as the focus of their their collecting and the artist trying to spotlight and highlight them and trying to do everything good by them, right? But no one would see their collection unless maybe they exhibit it somewhere at some point in time, right? But then it's the geographic limitations that prevent most people from ever really mm -hmm. even seeing or experiencing the art as it was created versus the collections now, which are just open to everyone. And everyone's collector history, like is if you, do a little bit of work, you can find it and you can see the work of, and the art. And then you can click in if they have like an on cyber or a Monaverse or a Crypto Voxels gallery and experience it at scale in these virtual worlds. Add another layer with like the, the VR headsets if you if you want to go there. But even like on a monitor, it's it's enough. It's good enough to get that extra level of experience. And then the social inputs that people are, are seeing, like while other people are really collecting this and are very serious about this and then seeing the numbers go up, like doing their own thing, right? It just, everyone is able to tell their own story. Everyone is able to approach this in their own way, not, not in a way where it's like, this is the only way to do it. Gatekeepers here, no one else comes in. We're gonna like keep it nice and tight. No, like everyone's fucking doing their own thing. Right. And the conversations that erupt around how people are doing it one way or the other, or some other way that people didn't even think was possible, helps move the space forward and helps gain more interest 
and mindshare from folks that are maybe not currently in it, not currently a part of it, but again, through those conversations, find their way here. And since the tools are so open, then they write their own stories based on how they interact with it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's perfect. Um, that was a perfect kind of segue too into like this idea of the people who aren't here yet. <clears throat> and um, bringing that back to what you said earlier about how you've now started collecting physical art too, because you wanted you, you saw beautiful digital space was well you wanted your physical space to reflect that as well. And I mean, you hear the story of this quite often, it seems like in the space that there's a lot of collectors that came to physical art through digital art, which I think is like amazing. Yeah. It's like, holy shit. Like, I mean, I think that's an unintended consequence, honestly, of, of this space, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. But, um, but also it, it touches on this, um, how do we even, uh, this, this materiality kind of uh, mindset that you seem to be fully beyond, you know, and when I talk to Colburn, he's beyond and a lot of people in this space seem to be on like that materiality kind of mindset. But as you were saying, how you could go into digital spaces now and you could see it, you can take all the work with you everywhere you go, et cetera. And then you brought up the VR thing. And then my mind went straight to like, um, to AR how yeah. in the future, you know, AR, you can maybe have everything in your pocket that you actually see all around you. Um, how like as technology increases, the way that you'll be able to interact with your digital art will increase and change. You know, um, you have holograms of a digital sculpture in your room. How cool would that be? You know, like in the center of your room, if you have a hologram of a digital sculpture that appears to be real, like just as real as anything else, you see the texture in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I said the same thing to Colborne, but like, how often are you going to go up to that sculpture if it was real, if it was there and just fucking touch it <laughs> just to like feel its presence? You know, you're never going to do that. So like the idea of having the hologram there to some people sounds crazy, but it won't be crazy to your brain when we're there and the technology's there. Your brain's going to accept this as easily as accepted the fact that you don't touch every dollar you make, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be, it'll, it'll easily accept that. But what do you think? How early are we in this stage of people accepting digital art? Because we still have so much hate. There's still much, there's so much hate against um, the NFT community for whatever reason. And so many people uh, remain seemingly incapable of making this jump, this like getting over materiality for whatever reason, uh, hypocritically, because they live half in a, in a post material world already. So what mm -hmm. is, what, what do you, what's your take on this? <laughs> and, what, and, and, and well, not not even what's your take on this, I guess, because you did end saying like this breaking into getting more people into the space. Like, how does that happen, though? Like, because to me, it's simultaneous, this breakdown in people's materiality. And that's a, the way that they view value, the way that they view assets, the way that they view belongings. And mm -hmm. then also more people coming into the space go parallel. So how how does that all work in your mind? So. God, there, there's so many different threads that I think are, are tied up together, right? There, there's the thread of people that that don't consider them artists or don't consider themselves like appreciators of art for whatever reason. I think that goes back to just a lot of people don't have good experiences with art or they're taught art in a very boring way, in a way that turns them off. So a lot of people just kind of like flick a switch off, mm. like I'm not an art person. And they sort of like roll through life like that up to a point but then what what nft land like what 2021 did for a lot of people was throw art back in a lot of people's face faces it also threw a lot of other shit <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> a lot of other shit. pfp craze whatever whatever like yeah art was just, it was in there though <laughs> yeah yeah i mean art was art art's the base at which like all this sprouted on top of it like the real artists that cared about what they were doing that were kind of instilling this but uh, like the action of minting work and then the collectors that were collecting it like that was a base that was broadening widening deepening that allowed other projects to build on top of it such that when everything exploded in the mass media artists benefited but of course everyone else did too and folks that were wielding other tools that were like hey profile picture like you know, like they able to benefit through like marketing and everything mm -hmm. in a way that mm -hmm. was interesting. Anyway, bringing people in and like, oh, this is not the art and 
having it confront them, there are a lot of people that were like, okay, actually, I do kind of like what I'm seeing here. And you saw a whole lot of people come into the space and collect ostensibly because they liked the aesthetic of things, PFP or otherwise, PFP or art. And I think that action, say what you will about PFPs being shit, whatever. I firmly believe that for the most part, right? <laughs> that they're shit? Yeah, yeah. And overpriced, all that, like, hype bubble, all that, right? But a lot of people did come in, and a lot of people said they are in it for the art, right? I think a lot of people, if they really look and, like, self-reflect, will probably think, maybe I also did it because I thought I would become, like, a millionaire, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easier to say. But when it comes, I, do people say that about PFP projects? Like, people who are into PFP projects, they say, like, I came here for the art. They say that? Last year is really funny hearing people talk about like apes and they're like, yeah, yeah, the art's dope though. The art's dope though. And you can look at certain things and be like, okay, I guess it doesn't look terrible, right? Um, well, yeah, but that's like saying like the gorillas are look dope, like or like a like what? That's weird. But you would never say that's art though. Anyways, ag agreed. Ag I would never say that it's art. But for people that may have had that art switch turned off in their minds coming in and mm. seeing that and then maybe having saying mm -hmm. that as an excuse for them to to understand and be like okay actually mm -hmm. like, i really do like this trying to like mm -hmm. reconcile while they're why they're in the space mm -hmm. why they're spending money why they're getting excited to to have them talk about the the visual work the art or whatever i think that that's a positive indicator that although we are still very early in this grand scheme of things and there's a lot of hype and like um, expectations that are out of whack with reality the fact that the switch can be turned back on for folks and people can learn to appreciate and start to think more about art and artists i think that bodes well for the future because there's a lot of people going back to early days on scent that were non-artists that were like why are you fucking talking about crypto art like, why are you mm -hmm. doing this why are you spending this money that have since become artists themselves have mm. since become serious collectors themselves so watching that change and seeing how important it is to confront people and have more people confronted with art so that they can start grappling with it and figure out that oh they can be an artist too or you, they can do whatever they want or they can find the art that actually speaks to them that they vibe with that they learn to love yeah could potentially collect and look at every single day of their lives when they wake up or go to bed and have just that much more art in their lives to make their lives that much more beautiful that's that's a positive direction regardless of what For price sure. things end up doing yeah right? And you, you said at the beginning too, or whatever, like, man, I, I love it so much. Like how people will just be like, I'm not an art person because they maybe didn't have access or the knowledge or whatever. It seems kind of esoteric or guarded or whatever, you know, so they just go, I'm an art person and not an art person and go through life that way. You can say that for any number of things, right? I'm not yeah. a this or that person and just go through life. That's how most people go through life about something, at least you and I included, I'm sure about something. I'm not, we both have a preconceived notion, but anyways, art as one of those things to me is dangerous because um, art is a, is a natural human instinct. And, I, and I, maybe art, not art, art's not the right, creativity is a natural human instinct that if you do not exercise like a regular muscle or something that it atrophies and it will actually like um, detract from your life. It will like become cancer or fucking something. Like I truly believe this, that the creative impulse is like breathing to the human being. Like we're meant to be creators. Like we are meant to be creative in whatever way that is. You know, it doesn't mean everybody should be an artist. Not at all. I do not believe everybody mm -hmm. can even be an artist. Like, but everybody has the creative impulse in some regard. If that manifests as collecting, that's what it is, but that's mm -hmm. fine. But every human being has that innate within themselves as an instinct, as, as natural as breathing. And I would say 95% of the population ignores it and they live um, a percentage of life because of it. They live, uh, they live a, a, an unrealized potential in themselves in that way. And it's really sad. And if this crypto art uh, can help to bring that back out in people like you, you are saying, fucking Christ, man. I mean, I think that you just 
you sold me on this space more than anybody has. And I've been in it for a year already, you know? So like, that's fucking gorgeous, man. That's gorgeous. Yeah, the way that, that you were explaining that, um, like that latent human creativity, use it or lose it kind of thing. Um, the using of it just sort of like drew a parallel with the movie or the story like Limitless, you know, with Bradley Cooper. Uh, the drug, yeah, yeah. And that unlocked 100% of his brain. I, I feel like the creativity part, like once you, once you find an outlet where you can kind of experiment with that creativity, um, which not a lot of people have had access to, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And like experimenting with it means getting feedback from your experiments. It, being creative in isolation means nothing, right? <laughs> like, what, what is it? Like you can be insane, you can be insane and just like go do what you want and just stay in your room forever and then leave behind a body of work that maybe gets discovered and that's whatever. But to be able to be creative and get a reaction, hopefully positive at some point, but then also feel good about the creative process and that spurs you on to do more. Like that's fucking everything. That opens mm -hmm. up like a hundred percent of like, oh. I can do whatever I want and be happy with this. And like, it just turns that muscle on that you can grow stronger and stronger. Like you're saying. Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, like social media did that for me in a way, you know, for all the pitfalls of social media, when social media came around and like, I was very early on Tumblr, you know, like very mm -hmm. early Tumblr influencer, you know, like, yeah. Um, and, uh, I that that's exactly the feeling I got when I started sharing my work and getting that positive feedback on it. And then just started seeing the world open up bigger and bigger yeah. and the possibilities and everything, you know, and, and that's why I've chosen to take the route of social media and everything up until this point. But um, well, the, hold on, um that, that part is huge, because I mean, as someone that's non visually, like uh, visual artistically creative, seeing folks that were on early on Tumblr, with their visual art, just like crush folks on Instagram with photography and just sharing, like sharing the perspective of their life that looks super glossy or whatever, and just blow up, up crazy folks on Twitter that are just witty as fuck and know how to write just mm -hmm. zingers that just blow up that and bloggers that blow up. That was always so like, damn, how do you, how do you get there? Right. And for or how do you, or, or like, even what do you do with that? You, there's that too but the beginning part too there's so many people that are like man i'm not as quick as that they they can write but just not at that level the consistency may not be there for the algorithm to kind of surface mm. them for the people mm -hmm. to expose them so there's so many people that were like closet creatives that tried it out and it's just like there's zero feedback and it's like they, it just suffocated everything right and crypto sort of like once you can attach for like once you have a medium where you can do whatever you want and because there's money that you can program on top of it, it exposes the opportunity, increases the opportunity to be exposed to other people, to have other people see it and react at least in a small way. So you see a reaction. Okay. People saw it at least. And as long as you know that other people have seen it, sometimes that's enough to keep going and hopefully get better or just use that and be okay with that. And that's sort of like expanding that lower base of people that are flexing that creative muscle. I don't know. I just, I've always. No, that, it's awesome. And I mean, it's a great, uh, like the way that collect, I love seeing collectors have virtual galleries now and they're always playing around with moving the stuff to me that, I mean, that's their art now. Like, wow. Like you're having a lot of fun. It looks like just playing around with organizing the art you've even collected. That is amazing. Like that's, um, that's them creating or flexing their creative muscle. And then they're showing it to your point, you know, and like getting the positive feedback, which makes them want to do it more. I hear this kind of thing from collectors all the time. Like it is a really nice cyclical uh, environment um, that this creates, as, as you said, you know, like, and as we hear all the time, collectors become the creators, collectors become, or collect, creators become collectors, et cetera, et cetera. Right. It is a really beautiful thing. Um, what is going on though with nifty with that so like that's a nice segue into this whole thing going on with nifty and this creators or whatever is going on um not and whatever i didn't mean to sound flippant about it but mm -hmm. that's a new thing fake whale is part of it so i definitely want to bring it up but where you're bringing in like it seems almost as if like teams of collectors or galleries that are kind of like propping up on top of um this crypto ecosystem now you're bringing those people 
into Nifty Gateway themselves. So these people who've been collecting the work and like I just said, might play around having a virtual gallery, but now even able to, to have an official place where they can expose the artists, almost going back to what you said earlier about how you just love to interview artists. Now you don't just get to collect interview or collect an artist and talk to them. You can give them opportunity by saying, we have this space over on Nifty and maybe you haven't dropped a Nifty before. Maybe you didn't have the connections or whatever. And now through the collector. And I mean, I mean, just to tie that even to what we were just saying, that even is a creative impulse that these collectors get to scratch. You know, I worked with um, 33 on a Nifty drop uh, yeah, earlier this yeah. year. And I bet for 33, these kind of interactions is a form of art for him. He's the artist of his life. Or, or as Don Miguel Ruiz would say, who wrote The Four Agreements, you know, we are all the artists of our own lives, you know. So anyways, like the collectors becoming uh, almost galleries and being able to flex their creative muscles on a platform like Nifty. What was, is that kind of the inspiration behind why Nifty made this move? Or could you yeah. talk about that? So the the product feature is called Publishers, right? And it's it's an evolution of what Nifty has has become, especially up until like the launch of Publishers on September first. Um, so prior to Publishers, there was one one publisher, the the Nifty Gateway curated team. So myself and there's five other um, producers mm -hmm. that are working with artists and releasing them, right? During that time, we also were hit up by a bunch of, of collectors, 33, of course, being like front and center right there, RX2, but then also increasingly like external, like traditional galleries, like Moco Gallery, right? And they have their relationships with their artists and like, we would like to release a collection as well. And they did really, really well. And not, not only like were sales good for them and the artists were happy releasing in their collections and like the positive association over time with particular collectors or galleries and, and that whole thing. But they were bringing new collectors like with each mm -hmm. of their drops, right? And that was really interesting. So like the goal of Nifty Gateway is to, to onboard like a billion people to NFTs, some shape, way or fashion. You don't do that by keeping things super contained right? You need to open up the levers of creation mm. and curation and collecting to more people. So the idea of elevating 33 and RX to a local gallery and now fake whale, which I want to deep dive into because I feel like fake whale is what I've personally been waiting for on the publisher side of things. The artist led curatorial sensibility click that's going to yeah, I'm fucking so excited about it. But giving them those tools to expand and reach new collector bases, um, bring on new artists that otherwise just we, because of the human limited bandwidth that we have as a curated team, like we wouldn't be able to get to or address mm -hmm. or feature. That's sort of the direction where we're going in with this experiment. And, and so it, it, it's, yeah, it's, I love it. And I think it's pretty smart the way that you're doing it too because what you brought up about how do we have to open up to more people like if we have to get more people in how do you do that um but in my mind it was like how do you do that while keeping the high, quality high right while, while keeping yeah. um you know opening the gates but not to just anything you know um how do you even do that there needs to be curation so the way that you're doing it by bringing in established people who have proven to have you know um taste and who are dedicated to finding you know up and coming talents and stuff like that is cool and i loved working with 33 on my drop like um that was that was so fun um 33 is great and yeah, I just love uh, working with them. So just shout out to 33 real quick. But yeah, let's deep dive into Fake Whale because you brought it up. And um, I love uh, I love what you said, like the artist run curation. Like we're fucking stoked too. Like, yeah. do, is there is there any other, you know, really like artist led curatorial teams that are that are part of the publishers? No, no, this I was talking to Sky about this. And this is the first like uh, artist collective uh, that is releasing on Nifty that I know of. Right. I know there's oh, been yeah. other attempts at like artist led collectives to do things like FOMO Mag, I think, like Robinus and Oh yeah. Um, yeah, Robert for sure. And that crew, right? I know like um 
what is it, Bay? I forget what the acronym stands for, the old marketplace, Sasha Bailey, blockchain art, whatever. Like that was more artist focused or whatever, but it was all very, very small. But now with, with the fake whale team and that approach, it's just like, finally, artist led, collector curator art. Like it's just- Yeah, it's super cool. I'm really excited. Like when, um, when all this came together last year, uh, when Sky and I met and all that, like, yeah, we knew that this was going to be something too. And I guess, to be honest, I hadn't heard that, or I guess I hadn't heard it worded that way until you just said it, like the first artist led, you know, curatorial team in the space, uh, you know, if we're at that, that's actually publishing or releasing and stuff, that's, that's huge. That's fucking cool. And, you know, I think that, you know, not to be egotistical, but I think we're the ones to fucking do it. You know, me and Sky, I, and our team, um, we are so dedicated to art. I know Sky is just such a huge fan of a very high conceptual, intelligent art. You know, he is a real, real dialed in. And I'm just like uh, an aesthetic, crazy person. Um, yeah. So we can't wait about this opportunity. Like, do you think... Um, what do you think about collectors viewing this though? Like I'm almost now just having a personal conversation with you, but like, how do you think collectors are going to respond to a team of curators that is made up of artists though? Like, do you think maybe that that collectors want to listen to other collectors more than they want to listen to artists? Or do you think they're open to listening to artists? I think we're actually in a really special position though, because we have Sky Golpe with us, who's well-respected, you know, outside of just being an artist, he's a fucking genius in uh, just like the crypto space. So like he's, you know, he's up there with the collectors too. So you can trust this guy, but like, what, what is, what is your thought on just that, this dynamic? Yeah. I mean, collectors that appreciate history and like, we're, we, we don't have like the deepest history yet. We're, we're like five years old. Like it's not very old yet, but going back to the early days of crypto art, it was artists collecting other artists. Right. And a lot of the taste and sensibilities that those early artist collectors exhibited or they highlighted like the true gems that collectors that are not artists coming into the space were like, oh my God, like that's, that's treasure and throwing crazy bids up and elevating floors and all that good stuff. Right. But it was the artists themselves that were able to spot that and highlight it, collect it, and then curate through the transactions, specific art and artists. Right. So what fake whale is to me is just this, it's an evolution of what's already been happening but more focused, more potent, right? Yeah. And excited to, to see that. I think storytelling about it and talking about that lineage, I think that helps frame it for collectors that may be newer, that may have not dove in or di uh, deep dived into the history, right? But setting that kind of mental expectation uh, in the place and role that artists have had on the collecting side of things in the space, I think that's super important. And the- Yeah, I love that. The bulb is turned on more, above collector's heads, then I think they're going to get it too. But even before that, the artists that you're curating and like the, the plan drops that, that I've had a glimpse into, it's just so dank. And you don't even need to know the background story because the collections are so tight. The artists are like, yeah. Going. And then it's just, when you collect something, you like to go deeper as a collector, at least me personally, I know a bunch of other two people as well. And then when you see that there's that, much deeper lineage and history and like the team behind it you're like oh fuck jesse's part of it. oh fuck sky's part of it once you learn what fake whale is then it's just it's something that you can keep growing right and that's to me that sustainable aspect is really really exciting to me that's keeping things sustainable and able something keeping the potential to grow always alive allowing more artists to come in more collectors to be exposed that to me is the most important thing at this like early stage of the space and fake well is is well poised to help yeah that. well poised is is uh is well said like we're always going to be well poised because we always want to keep on doing something new ready to pivot at any moment or whatever you know season one was even different than season two season two was actually helped quite a bit by nifty being able to get this opportunity to be a publisher i love what you're you're drawing the parallel to the early crypto days of being artists supporting other artists and then the collectors looking to those artists as to, as to like what is what kind of mm -hmm. um and that this is kind of a return to that because it almost felt like there was a divergence from that uh in 2021 yeah. particularly where it seemed almost as if collectors were just forming little collector groups 
and we're like, we're going to pick this person to just for no reason, because <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like that's what 2021 seemed like to me. I was just like, you all want to be cane makers, you know, and just like random cane makers, you know. Um, but that's not how shit fucking works. And that's not <laughs> how history is ever. That's not how history has ever fucking worked, you know, like, yeah. so I think there's going to be a lot of collectors who are a little maybe they won't regret anything because it was an investment into this space more than it was an individual artist. But like, yeah. I have a feeling that in that 2021 craze, there was a lot of shit being bought for a lot of money for that's not going to be worth anything someday because it's going to be seen for what it, what it really was and like cash grab and stuff. But um, you do see the narrative too, like where people are trying to say it. You, it, it's kind of how you were saying earlier with like the PFP buyer saying here for the art. Um, where you see the collectors being like, watch the artist, who do they collect? Those are who's important. And then you look at what they collect and you're like, but you only collect, you know, like the biggest selling, most hyped shit, you know, like you're just saying that to sound like, you know, what you're talking about or talk or that you care about the art or whatever. But anyways, <laughs> oh, no, it's so like, funny. Um, I, I think that point, uh, like how you frame 2021, like um, the negative side of things too, or what will probably come to be seen more as a negative is like that kingmaker mentality on the side of a lot of the, the larger whale collectors that were coming in and were splashing large sums around. Um, I mean, I don't know if we'll edit this out or anything like that, but I think it's really important. To nope, talk. we like, won't. <laughs> There's like, no like, editing. <laughs> someone, someone like an 888 that came in and was throwing large sums around at certain people. Um, I think it's unfortunate for for some of the artists that are on the receiving end of that. It's positive because, whoa, they got big a big collector coming in collecting a lot of their work. But for someone like MBSJQ, um, having their one of one market just absolutely explode and sort of new heights, but really the only big collector there being 888, right? And for a period of time while he was around, that's great. Kind of stoked a lot of FOMO from other collectors that are like, well, it's a lot of money. Maybe I should collect this person too. But then when the Kingmaker collectors disappear and as they're apt to do, <laughs> if they're in there just for like this pump and dump kind of approach, but which they obviously were, mm -hmm. then you leave the artists high and dry and what they, the markets that they thought were their markets are not their markets. Mm -hmm. And they're left with, basically no collectors anymore because you collectors that yeah. on the the run up and then there's the weird calibration of like okay well what should i price my work at now and it's <laughs> you're in a lose lose when you get into yeah. those situations so it's the artist curating it goes back to what you said bro it's it goes back to what you said about sustainability it, earlier on you know like that's just not sustainable i saw that in 2021 where it was like if you just in, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I'll just say that. Yeah. Sustainability is important in an artist's career. And when you do something like that, like that's not sustainable, like you're going to be in trouble. And I will also draw the parallel that this does happen in the traditional world as well. It's yeah. not it's not native to crypto in the crypto art world in the traditional art market. When I was working with galleries, you know, I would hear about these things a lot. You would actually hear about um, collectors that did these kind of things, um, trying kingmaker type uh, behavior and would fuck up the markets of artists in the traditional world. So every yeah. now and then I would have a gallerist come to me and be like, hey, so-and-so, you know, name of a collector is going around buying up lots of work right now. If they come to you, let me know, like we, we should talk about it. It might not be the best move. So I just want to put that out there too, that it's not a, a natively crypto thing. This is an art market thing. And mm, also yeah. like, I wanted to make that aware just because there's so much negative news around NFTs and, and stuff that is like, they try to make seem like it's a crypto thing and it's not, it's just a human nature thing maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and it's the, the, the ability for artists and the folks around artists to help curate better collectors, I think is, is yeah. it's becoming more and more and more important. I mean, it's always been important, like you're talking about like historically, right? But especially in the space as early, as the and fast activity. and fast fast as fuck oh my god it's still so so fast yeah being able to curate better better collectors is just again like sets artists up and i think again like the cura curated approach um to everything it just becoming more and more important um, in artists lives uh, 
on the curation side of things as an artist being curated and then an artists curating their collectors as well. Yeah, curating collectors is an interesting is an interesting take that, you know, overlooked, I think, a little bit. But that's again another thing that goes back that happens in a traditional world too. It's not it's not yeah. crypto native. It's just, you know, being good uh, about your career and your art. Um in it so you we both just said how fast it is and you said how fast it is still. And I laughed because I just thought immediately about the story that came out just a couple of weeks ago, you know, NFTs are dead. And I'm like, fuck, man, yeah. we died. We died and it's still too fast, man. This is the afterlife. We should be chilling. But we we're not. We died so many times, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I know we died last yeah. year. <laughs> like, at least a oh, couple yeah. times. Dying again. <laughs> so, like, I want to use that as kind of a jumping point into this uh, kind of last leg of the conversation of, like, where, where you see this going. Where, what period are we in now? So we had, like, we just talked about the boom. The cane makers came in and splashed huge money on artists and we don't know where any of these people are anymore and like there's people like myself and the fake whale team and you and like real you know people who see the potential in this and you know probably are going to be the ones to help break it to the the larger community you know like the larger audience of people as we said was necessary earlier but like what where are we right now in this phase as you coming from somebody who was there at the beginning lived through 2020 build up the 2020 just like what the fuck is even happening and then the crash at the earlier this year mm -hmm. now that we're riding this bear market um these are topics that i normally don't bring up in the converse in these conversations but you're really specially suited for it especially with your history and being a collector and just smart where are we now and how okay the, well i want yeah, to do no. where are we now and how should an artist feel in this market because sometimes I have, you know, as an artist in this market who last year left the traditional world, basically, like I didn't leave, I'm throwing the show next year, all this stuff, like I'm very physical, but I left <laughs> my safety nets, Yeah, feel me? I left like the gallerist, I left the gallery, I left, you know, this and became autonomous and then everything kind of crashed and now we're in what was called a bear market, NFTs are dead is the new story. Um, and I'm like, well, shit, it doesn't feel dead. I don't think it's dead, but then you have a bad day. You have a mental health day and you're just like, what the fuck? So anyways, that's kind of where I wanted to bring this conversation of like, what's going on now? Because I know inherently we're early. We're at the beginning days. Like that pop last year was nothing compared to what is coming. I just don't know when it's coming. So talk a bit about this, please. A lot of people like to anchor where we are and like our development to like past like especially on the technical side past um cycles like going back to dot com bubble and like early dot com development people oh we're like 93 or 96 and that um that developmental cycle i like to think about like the seasonality of a, of the space right people will say we're in the bear market now versus a bull, but and it's not particularly helpful it's like well what does that what does it mean like is this the same as before or, or whatever and I, I had a tweet yesterday and i was just kind of trying to think about like what season are we in because things kind of go back and forth and, and they well they use that word even you know like they even they even try to use that word in one is it one-on-one season is it pfp season you know so like yeah. use the terminology makes sense yeah and the fact that you're hearing a lot more people one of one season grail season i like grail season personally it's, it's way more optimistic Right. But we've already mm -hmm. seen, in my mind, a grail season and we've seen two bull seasons so far. So it's like, in my mind, NFT land has two, two dominant seasons. It's either grail season, which is accumulation, creation. Like, obviously, it's like the tourists have left for the season. And consolidation. Consolidation. Exactly. Lower sales volumes. But this is this is where the create like the real creation on the artistic side, on the technical, technological side, on every side, fundamentally have innovation, like how we're utilizing this technology, any new developments that's happening in grail season, as I define it. Um, the first grail season happened after the full first NFT bull season, first NFT bull season, crypto kitties to, which is like November, December, 2017 to roughly like February, March, April, 2018, there's a bunch of hot potato NFT projects, fucking mm. scams all the way down. But like 
market had been pumping ETH crypto all time highs before the crash at the beginning of 2018. And then like April, 2018, moon origin, super rare mainnet launch artists slowly coming in, doing their thing. August sent uh, of 2017 mainnet launch, other creatives coming in, doing their things, platform builders, open C doing their thing, right? No big numbers, but this is where the real creating real creation started early collectors that and such. And the, the first grail season lasted until I would probably put it at the mid to latter part of 2020. So you can say like summer, I would even cite like Colborn and Pablo coming in almost as like that the transition between first grail season to the bull season that mm. fully erupted beginning in like February, 2021. That's when shit fucking exploded. And then you have that mm -hmm. other big peak with the PFP craze in August of, of 2021. But the, this May is when things started to, to transition again to grail season. Things started to consolidate. Mm -hmm. at, but you're still seeing a larger number than we've ever had before, number of artists minting mm -hmm. work, selling it. More collectors are in the space than have ever been here before collecting. More teams are building new projects that are still not at market or not to market or in beta stage still. So we're back in that grail season. And like, what that what does that mean for, for an artist? Don't die. <laughs> you want to <laughs> see the next season, don't die. Stay, keep doing what you're doing, right? Don't think that you need to like squeeze every last penny out of every last sale. Like sometimes you gotta have fun with it. Play it loose and wow, like, Make collectors happy. Make make yourself happy with whatever whatever happens, right? You can be smart and strategic, like like Sky Gold Bay. You don't have to release all the time. You can think about like, okay, well, let's have like a real big launch or a big drop once a year, right? Maybe twice a year. Let's space it apart and then let's have fun in between. Let's do fun little projects, right? But stay alive. <laughs> make sure that like folks know you're still here. I think that's the most mm -hmm. important. Part. differentiate yourself yeah. so when the next bull happens people will look to you because they'll remember you versus the tourists that come in and whatever if that makes sense no it, it yeah it absolutely does like it, it's an exciting time right now it feels like i mean for me as someone who didn't who wasn't there at the 2017 2018 you know bull run i fucking wish i was man i sold I sold my first piece of art for crypto in 2018. It just wasn't a, an NFT or, or digital even. It was a physical piece of art, but I collected crypto back then. I started collecting crypto in 17. And um, I put an ad out on, not an ad, but like a, an Instagram post saying like, I'll accept crypto at this point for, yeah. for you know, for, for artwork instead of, you know, cash payments. And people thought I was nuts, <laughs> but I, um, yeah. but I sold a, I sold a physical piece for one Ethereum which at the time was like nothing, but, um, but yeah, I don't even know why I cut that up, honestly, but it's just so like interesting to hear that it's already died once before. Most people aren't aware, you know, of that 2017, 2018, then the 2019, uh, 2018, not 2019, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bear market or what you would call it grail season yeah. and then coming back, you know? So, I mean, it's a hopeful story and it, to me, you brought up Sky Gope. Sky Gope just said it to me the other day. He's like, digital wallet. That's all you need to say, bro. He's like, everybody will have one someday. That's all you need to know. Like, they ain't going away. He's like, there's nothing else that needs to be said, you know? So, I mean, I agree. When, once, How many people have digital wallets now? And then how many people are on the planet? How many people have the internet? How many people have a smartphone? You could probably say that at some point in the near future, everybody with a smartphone will have a digital wallet. And as soon as they have a digital wallet, why won't they have you know, all kinds of digital art and belongings exactly. within it. So yeah, and the yeah, it makes sense from like internet to like half the world or half the planet connected to the internet took like two decades, which is in grand scheme of things like really, really fast. But now that like three quarters of the world is connected to the internet, what's the adoption? Well, this is going to be, yeah, the wallet. I think you're going there. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, a hundred percent. Well, the wallet's going to be so much easier than the internet, like, because like to exactly. introduce the internet to the world within 20 years is insane to think about when that actually took like physical shit had to happen. You had to build stuff and wire stuff and whatever else and like satellites and like all this shit 
digital wallet, it's it, you program it and then you download. Like it's gonna take no time. I I I think that everybody's gonna have a digital. Okay, let me just ask you. What's the time frame? When is everybody gonna have a digital wallet? I mean, we already do. People just don't call it that. But like, when are they gonna have like a Web three wallet? Like, when when is this integration? Oh, I I hate making predictions like that. I'm not good at that, okay. so I, I usually shy away from it. I usually look at like well, what, what's going to facilitate that, right? Great. And like on the creative front, like if you have an internet connection, you can you can create and be a part of this today. And you're you're seeing the the early stories like already haven't emerged, which will only spread in like their 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 particular locations. Ushinachi is one that you always go back to, or I always go back to. Nigeria, making art using Microsoft fucking Word, <laughs> right? Selling it that way, gaining notoriety in his homeland there, and the the continent of Africa being more and more they connected to the internet now, almost like fully through their their different devices. But now, like with the the advent of of other like purely digital creative tools, like that's only going to spread when other people are like, oh, I want to become an artist or a creator. I want to do something like that, right? So then it's just the more stories we can spread about people having success as creators or in this space that are from different parts of the world, that is what's going to accelerate the digital wallet adoption, right? That's it. And how quickly can a story spread? instantaneously mm -hmm. like what goes viral yeah. in, in any particular place and it's not like globally viral it's like well what goes viral in your neck of the woods and your neck of the woods ideally if it's not like already like the mind share is not there the mind share will be there with that that next viral story that integrates nfts crypto art or something else that's a part of the space that then will it's, it's yeah it's really interesting how you said that, that uh, how quickly can a story circulate instantaneously, right? And that kind of goes back to what you said, like, I don't like to make predictions, et cetera, et cetera. And when it comes to the crypto space, I find it to be impossible. I, I too don't make predictions. I hate that I ask people for predictions even because I don't make them myself, but I always am asking people for predictions. But but within the crypto space, particularly in the crypto art space, particularly, it seems impossible to make predictions because of exactly that, because of the it, it's it's one of the maybe early or first or whatever, where where virality matters, <clears throat> where virality turns into money, where virality turns into substance, maybe virality turns into I'm, I'm literally real time searching for this word, but it's the first place where virality can actually manifest into something besides like internet fame, you know, where it can actually yeah. man like, so like to try to predict when will the next bull run be, it'd be like, who the fuck knows, man? It could be literally <laughs> five days from now, if Beeple sells another million dollars, something that, you know, something could happen like in the news and it just takes off fucking. Uh, Elon Musk could do something. We see the fluctuation in prices of crypto within moments because of that. So adoption could be around the corner at any spark moment. So predictions are kind of, you know, useless. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It's, it's all about like, what, what are those stories? Focus, focus on the stories that are exciting to you. And then maybe, maybe it translates, maybe not. Um, but at least you had fun finding the story. And if you got some enjoyment yeah. out of Either creating and, it, and it ain't going to work. That's that's it. Like, what else? What else mm -hmm. you want to do? Go stay, stay in a room by yourself, <laughs> create alone? No, like <laughs> you be a, you being a part of it's it's everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah, that's a beautiful place uh, to wrap this up, kind of. But I do want to ask you, like, uh, is there anything that you wanna want to throw out there before before we wrap this up and everything, like? We really didn't get into your personal life or anything, but it sounds really that you live a life similar to mine where it's like you live. It, it's um, I live in what Alistair Crowley called fucking total environment. You know what I mean? Like oh, where it's just cool. like there there ain't nothing that doesn't feed back into, the, you know, into everything else. It's I don't live a compartmentalized life where it's like I'm an artist and here I'm talking to Matthew as part of this. Like, no, nah, this is just part of everything else. And it seems like you've lived your life that way as well where you've integrated your love, the work that you do, the way that you interact with society, your friends, your culture is all through the same outlet. 
Yeah, like every there's no differentiation really between like life and work. At like living can be viewed as work. Work can be viewed as just like enjoying life. It's that natural harmony of like everything that I do is fun and happy and luckily you can translate that in a way that allows you to sustain and grow a family and like I spend half my time in Korea or try to spend roughly half my time in Korea throughout the year traveling um, a baby daughter and that good stuff so I'm just really blessed that like whatever I do kind of just it's all very complimentary and yeah creates great stories and something that I'm really excited to introduce to my daughter when she grows a, a yeah little, that's right? beautiful congratulations on the daughter I, I wasn't aware but yeah that's cool having someone to pass it down to and like be able to have that vision for the future and that's a beautiful place to end uh you are certainly living the rare life collecting rare experiences as as the tweet said that we started this all out with so really appreciate your time um as a whole of fake well i know that i can say that we are over the moon about you know being one of the publishers one of the first publishers on fake whale and especially after speaking with you and hearing how excited you are as um us being artist curators and this being the thing that you've been waiting for in particular really you know inspires me to to do right by that expectation so thank you so much again for your time matthew um that's it thank you everybody for tuning in anything else in in the end matthew Oh man, just thank you for having me on. It's been, I can't wait to meet up with you in real life. It's only a matter of time. Definitely have a few drinks. Where are you at? Uh, I'm over in Portland. Oh shit. Cool. Yeah. I'm just down South. Uh, I'm down the way. It's just in SoCal. So yeah, we're going to have to make that happen. I'm throwing a, a big show next year for, I have a book coming out, my second book. I have a book release. I'm going to try to get Sky over here. I don't know if you found out with him in person yet or not, but we definitely need to have some sort of meetup or even if we do it at the um, at Value Art sometime or in Italy. But yeah, I can't wait to meet up sometime and have some drinks with, uh, with the, the crew for sure. Oh yeah. I mean, thank you so much for your time and sharing the space. Hell yeah, brother. Thank you so much. Cheers everybody. Until next time.